Let's go to Beijing and speak to Aina Tangan, a senior fellow at the Taihei Institute. Aina, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Blinken says Beijing's vision would move us away from the universal values that have sustained so much of the world's progress over the past 75 years. Just another quote from a speech which I've read, and the thought immediately occurs to me that the Americans don't actually know how to react to the rise of China. This isn't as straightforward as it was after the Second World War, two nuclear powers, two distinct spheres of influence. The Americans seem a little bit sort of perplexed, maybe? Well, I mean, I mean, they're concerned. I mean, China's success story extends over 40 years. Initially, it was thought, well, you know, it's an aberration. Uh, China's uh, system of government is antithetical to anything that the U.S. knew. They always assumed that it would somehow implode. Instead, it's gone from success to success, whereas in the U.S., uh, the, the best system, uh, the dem you know, the U.S. democracy has failed. Uh, to, you know, deliver the kind of government you, you had earlier, uh, the, the reports of the police in action or alleged in action uh, during a shooting. Uh, people feel afraid. Uh, they do not feel the government can protect them. They think that they need guns or to keep their children out of public places like schools. So right now, the U.S. is, is concerned that, uh, you know, its type of government is under attack and that they need to, quote, defend it from a foreign um, enemy, which they perceive to be Beijing. One thing that many people around the world will be wondering, and they may have been wondering this for a long time, I know, is why China doesn't take a far more proactive role on the international stage. At the United Nations, for example. Okay, so we've just had a veto from China about sanctions on North Korea. But if you go back 2019, 2020, three vetoes from Beijing on humanitarian access to Syria. The world needs the Security Council to work. And when China continues to say, that's not our problem. We don't want you interfering in our domestic policies, so we're not going to interfere with the domestic policies of other countries. Sometimes the world needs that intervention. Yeah, but there's, there's a sensitivity to the fact that uh, others, like the United States, believe that everybody's uh, countries, every country's business is their business. And I think that's, an, uh, you're correct. There is a kind of an overreaction in in Beijing, but it's because they're, they perceive that they're under attack and that they need to maintain this principle in order to prevent uh, others from saying that, uh, oh, you, you should be doing this, you should be doing that, you shouldn't be a communist government, uh, you should have uh, voting the way we have voting. Um, you know, quite frankly, you know, especially after the financial crisis, a lot of people in China started to wonder what the U.S. represents. And uh, as did the Chinese government. And you, you're starting to see a real break from that point on. Uh, lately, you've seen almost daily attacks. And as I said, the Chinese are very sensitive to this. And they are saying, look, we're not going to engage in this. But I think um, starting with what happened in Alaska, uh, China has been much more proactive about putting its own agenda out there. Uh, they don't wait anymore to hear what the U.S. has to say and then you know, figure out what they're going to do. Uh, they're now, you know, going forward. They have this new uh, Pacific um, strategy with these island nations to address what is most concerning to them, which is climate change. Uh, Australia wasn't doing it. U.S. wasn't doing it. Now that China is being vilified for saying, yeah, look, we'll help. 24 hours ago, Wang Yi, foreign minister uh, from Beijing, was in the Solomon Islands. He said Beijing has no intention of building a military base there. I mean, you're mentioning this new Pacific strategy. Ten nations in total, Beijing would like to sign up uh, to common agreements, which the West says is just Beijing trying to take control of the region. Why would anybody believe Wang Yi when China's done exactly that in the South China Sea, building military bases, runways for fighter jets on reefs and islands that are disputed? Well, you know, it's interesting you bring up the South China Sea. First off, uh, China does not maintain any uh, territorial uh, ownership in, in these Pacific islands. South China Sea, they did, and they always have. I mean, it goes back to the founding of uh, modern China. The uh, map was put out there, uh, and no one made any kerfuffle about it. It's kind of like the Monroe Doctrine in the U.S. It was kind of fully implemented before uh, it became a cornerstone of U.S. policy, although at the time it was, I think, number 53 on the State of Union messages given by the president uh, in announcing it. Um, these things happen. Uh, countries grow. Uh, and in terms of the South Pacific, I think you should, the more analogous uh, situation is that China's trying to do there what they've done with RCEP, with Belt and Road Initiative. 
and that is to counter this deglobalization that the U.S. is pushing and uh, trying to get uh, trade packs, especially peaceful ones, in an area that surrounds them. Aina, thank you. It's always a pleasure to hear your analysis. Aina Tangan in Beijing.